fly ball left field. Half at the Ivy. Gone! Tyra Estrada launches one, a three-run homer. And the Giants have gone ahead here in the ninth inning. He got it up into the wind. Now, back to Willard and Dibbs on 95.7 The Game. All right, uh, this is good. Somebody who actually was competing on the field and dealing with these schmucks they call umpires. Easy with the I name know. calling. I know, okay. I know. No, you. I, I said something to you earlier. We'll, let, we're going to welcome George Contos into this conversation. One thing that I think bothers people about umpires specifically, more so than even refs in the NBA or in the NFL, Umpires do sometimes cruise around the field with this holier than thou. Like, I'm going to pull the mask off and look at the dugout like, hey, hey, children, speak to me again, and you're going to get thrown out of here. Which really triggers us when we realize umpires are like teachers with tenure. There's no consequence when they screw up. Right, George? If your ERA is six, George, you're getting the DFA. Aren't you? What what happens to an umpire when he gags for an entire month? Nothing. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, guys. First of all, thanks for having me. Second of all, I agree with everything that you guys just said. The umpires need to be held accountable. And I think that poor performance, all they do really is give them a slap on the wrist and then don't give them good playoff series or they don't give them playoffs at all. Um, but, you know, with their union, they have a very strong union. They can't get fired. They can't get demoted. But uh, it's the only job in the world, I feel like, where when you screw up and you, you have blatant poor performance, there's no ramifications of it. Well, I don't know if you've ever been slapped in the wrist, George, but it, it kind of hurts more than you think. <laughs> Depends on who's slapping. <laughs> exactly, but, yeah. and how sensitive your wrist is. Yesterday was an egregious example. His accuracy was 87% according to umpire scorecards or ump auditor, whichever one you you prefer. But even at the high watermark, 92% is the average for these umpires. Is that good enough anymore, George, knowing what we know about the ability to really read balls and strikes ourselves? Well, look, I mean, for, for, for the forever past history until that little strike zone that we see on TV now was implemented, it, it's very difficult to make those, those borderline calls. And the way that the strike zone works is you have a buffer, right? You have a you have a two inch or basically one ball buffer around the whole strike zone where whether you call it a ball or a strike, it, you, you can't really be penalized for it. And with, with pitches moving and breaking balls and all of those things um, that make it very difficult to be sitting behind home plate and making those calls consistently, you know, getting 92%, I would say is pretty good. That's an A average, you know, but in, in today's game, when we have the, capabilities of knowing exactly what a strike is as long as that little box that we see on TV is accurate for every individual person and batter that that steps into the batter's box. I mean, I, I just saw today actually that they were going to be implementing the automated balls and strikes challenge system or whatnot in AAA. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, in the future of the game at the major league level. How long do you think it takes, uh, George? Because again, I, like when we see this stuff in sports, it tells me it's coming. How, when, when do you think we're going to get automated or, or at least a review system for balls and strikes? I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the, uh, the, the challenge system being implemented as soon as next year, to be honest. I think if a, a team could maybe have three challenges a game or whatnot and you pick and choose your time to do it. But, you know, the calling of balls and strikes is the last thing really in the game that is done by the umpires. Otherwise, if you, ha if you take that completely out, there's really going to be no point. The game is kind of just polices itself with all the technology that we've implemented, which would be a little bit weird as well. It would be, but I think with what we know about count leverage now, and I'm looking at last night's game and Doval's behind 2-0 to Wisdom and the next pitch is a ball and yet they call it a strike and that really changed that at-bat and you had so many at-bats earlier in the game on 3-2 pitches where the Giants got rung up on pitches that were outside the strike zone. Is it a thing where because of the analytics and what we know about count leverage and the approach guys take that we can't afford not to go robotic, go full robotic and let the machines just take over. No, I'm not, I'm not in fan of that. I think that first of all, the, the, the approach to, to pitching and hitting has changed, you know, drastically. I, I still think there should be a two strike approach and you heard Hunter Pence say it on the broadcast yesterday. I'm not sure who was at bat. It might've been Cody Bellinger. He took a three, two pitch that was, right on the outside corner and it was bald and back in 
that at least when I started playing and towards the end of my career when I was playing, it started to shift a little bit. But there was a two strike approach. Like when the ball was was nearby in a two strike count, you at least make an attempt to follow it off or hit it the other way. And that has kind of changed a little bit with launch angle and, and what pitchers are trying to do, throwing the ball with high velocity at the top of the zone and big breaking balls off of that. But as far as leverage pitches anymore, I mean, I, I it's it's interesting. I mean, the Jorge Soler at bat yesterday that Assad had against him. There, there's no more count leverage. You're not you're not doing the fastball count and get back into count. You know, down and away fastball anymore. Guys are just trying to throw their their best stuff at all times, and everyone for the most part is in swing mode. So you're not really worried about that count leverage and getting ahead or falling behind as much as you used to. George Contos with us here. Willard and Dibbs, 95-7 the game. Here's something we haven't even brought up yet. Uh, that Tyro home run was a total Wrigley Field job. Like, he caught the airstream. <laughs> he did not get all of that ball. Do you have any stories of when uh, when someone took you deep at Wrigley and you're like, what? You barely even hit that thing. <laughs> Oh man, I'll tell you what, I have a great story of it. My, my, you know, who's come to be a very good friend now is Anthony Rizzo. My first time ever pitching at Wrigley Field. It was one of those day games where the wind was blowing out and I threw him a backdoor slider. First time I'd ever faced him at Wrigley. And he just went out and kind of flicked it to center field. And I was like, all right, I see Angel kind of drifting back for it. And Pagan kept drifting and drifting. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I <laughs> yelled out some pro. It went right into the basket. And I might have yelled out some adult languaged words on the mound. And, and I, I saw Rizzo rounding the bases, just kind of laughing at me. And, and it was just the most frustrating thing ever. That was the only hit he's ever gotten off me in, in, in both of our, uh, our fighting days facing each other. But you know, the other one that sticks out is the game one home run that Javier Baez hit in the NLDS uh, of 2016 off yep. Johnny Cueto. The ball went sky to the moon, and it just caught the basket. And it was just an unfortunate uh, series of events, obviously, after that. But there, there obviously there's a ton, depending on the, how the wind's blowing here at Wrigley. You can give them up easy, or you can have balls get hammered that don't go anywhere. Well, and we had a ball get hammered by Patrick Bailey and Mark and I were just watching the replay here in the studio and we were just waiting for the uh, Patty Barrels job. That thing was absolutely obliterated to right field. Yeah, again, when the wind blows right to left, when it's coming off the lake, you have to hit it really hard or really low line driver to get it out. George, by the way, you said here at Wrigley. You're there right now, right? And did I hear that you're bringing your daughter to her first game? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm at, I'm actually not quite there yet. We're, I'm, I'm at some, some very good friend's house that are about to walk over, and, and I took Dave Fleming. We went golfing earlier this morning, and I told him that we were going to bring uh, we're bringing our daughter to her first game. I have held out for so long of not going to a baseball game because I was like, I'm not going until we bring our daughter. It's got to be the Giants when they're in town. So we're going as a family today with some friends, and we're going to go on the field and, and have them take some pictures with her and bring her to her first baseball game. How, how did you and Flem hit him this morning, and where? <laughs> we played uh we played a golf course called the old elm club up in highland park and uh we hit him well we had a great time Flem uh F Flem got up nice and early it's uh, san francisco time and we we got up and we went and hit him he, he played great he's he's a good little player oh when you said he good got a little player when, when i you love said that he got up early i thought you meant he was ahead of you after six holes did we did, did we compete a little <laughs> bit today uh, we competed a little bit. We competed a little bit. We, we had uh, we had a, a very generous host, and we played just a little NASA front back total. So it was a team game, nothing uh, nothing mano y mano. But we had a, we had a lot of fun. It was a great track. It was it was actually cloud covered, so it wasn't nearly as warm as it is right now, which was fantastic because I don't think Flem would have made it having to uh, deal with that heat coming from the Bay Area. George, George <laughs> stop beating around the bush. Did you take the L or did you get the W? <laughs> I divulge nothing. Oh, come on. That means you got, it the, means w. You got the W. <laughs> There's no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Classic humble brag uh, after he dropped the uh, good little player on Fleming. And you mentioned, you know, you hit it well, but did you hit it as well as Elliot Ramos has been hitting it? Well, you know what? When, when you're going through these streaks that the one, like the one that Elliot's on right now, I mean, you really just try to try to pray that it, they never end because He's so balanced and he's so confident. And I mean, there were a couple of two counts yesterday that he just hit screaming missiles the other way. And when you can keep your weight back and just react the way he is and trusting his hands right now, hitting the ball the way he is, it's just so fun to watch. And, and he's doing something special. And I hope that every game that he goes out there, he continues to build that confidence. And what we've seen is a guy who's going to be in this lineup for a very long time. 
So I hope, uh, and you know, I know that I've spoken to him, and if you've heard him on post game live when we've interviewed him, the mental side of the game for him is something that he's worked on tremendously over the last few years, and it's really starting to pay dividends right now. And he's not getting too high and not getting too low. So I'd love to see him continue doing what he's doing for the for the long, long haul. Yeah, George, it's 137 at bats now. Do, you know, do you refer to it as a hot streak? In other words, what what is your belief on the sustainability? Of, of his play? Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, it's it's been 137 at-bats. Yeah, I mean, is he going to continue doing this for the rest of the season? I sure hope so because the way that he's playing is, is at an elite level. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back whenever, you know, maybe a couple hard line drives get caught, whenever things aren't going his way. It, it, this is such a long game and a long season that you really have to work very hard not to get caught up in the highs and the lows of it. If he can just continue doing his preparation and do what he's doing, I mean, if he does this for another few weeks, I mean, this is just the level of baseball that he's playing, right? It's it, you'll you'll have your fluctuations, but when he comes down to earth a little bit, because inevitably that will happen, and, and you know, if he's going to be playing like this the rest of the year, he's going to be a first team All MLB guy without question. Um, but it's just going to see how he bounces back whenever things aren't going as red hot as they currently are. Right, right now he's uh, heading toward National League Player of the Month if he keeps this up for the next uh, 10 or 12 days or so. Historical game coming up on Thursday at Rickwood. What does that mean for the Giants and Major League Baseball to return to such a historic site? Oh, I think it's great, you know, to just to honor the, the people who have gone through there and, and everybody in the Negro Leagues that, that have gone through there. And, you know, Willie Mays, unfortunately, is going to be able to make it, but it was the first place he played and, and, and what it means to him and what it means to the Giants organization to go back and, you know, honor a guy like not only him, but a, a guy like Willie Mays, who's been a, you know, pillar of this organization for its almost entirety in the, in the Bay area. Um, you know, he's the oldest living hall of famer currently right now. So for, for him to be able to reflect and, and reminisce about what that means to him and his you know, meaning to this organization, I think is fantastic and, and it'll be fun. I know, I know our, our, my coworker and our host, Laura Britt will be out there covering the game. I know a lot of people are really excited about it. Uh, George, what, what is the bar that you're setting for this team right now? And, and here's what I mean by that. When you look at them hovering around 500, uh, are you, are you disappointed or do you say, Hey, this team's hanging in there without more than half of its pitching staff. I think it's obviously a little bit of both, right? I mean, they're doing a great job of, of fighting and scratching and clawing and, and getting the wins with the people that they do have on the IL and you're missing Blake Snell and you, you have obviously Kyle Harrison who just hit the IL with his ankle and, you know, Robbie Ray and Alex Cobb and, and, and all the people that you have who are not able to be on the field right now. And then you, there's also disappointment where I think that the expectations of this team have, have been and still are much higher than this. But if you can tread water – and continue to claw and stay in the National League wildcard picture and even gain ground on those Dodgers with that series coming up next week. There's a lot of things that can happen in the second half of this season. We're nowhere near the end of this thing. I mean, we're just getting to the fun part. The dog days aren't even here yet, so there's a lot of things that can happen. Yeah, it's awesome, and I I hope that uh, one of the only 34 guys to ever homer off you can get hot. (laughs) Uh, Current giant Jorge Soler, one of only 34 men to homer off you in the bigs, George. Man, 34 homers, that's a lot. I remember one year I gave up like 19 of them, and Kruko was like, he pulled me aside, and he goes, Georgie, you had a great year, but that's too many homers, man. <laughs> well, remind uh, him Remind him it should only be 33, because that Rizzo one was BS, yeah. George. Yeah, the Rizzo one was BS. The, uh, you know, my other infamous homer that I gave up at Wrigley Field, which I am reminded about all the time since I live here, and then, you know, the, the golf club that I play out of, they're all Cubs fans. One of the guys comes up to me and he goes, hey, remember when you gave up that home run to Travis Wood in the NLDS? And I said, yeah, man, I remember that. Thanks for bringing it up. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, while we're in the space, uh, what happened with the Clayton Kershaw home run off you? Oh, man. Well, you know, someone's got to give him up. And I hope from now on that he never hits another one ever again because he won't. <laughs> and I'm I'm going down in the record books. And Kershaw is, is, me and Kershaw were forever intertwined. So great, George. Hey, have a great time tonight yes. with, with your daughter's first game, George. That's awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks for coming on. There you go. He's George, a good sport, too. George Contos. George Contos, good sport.